Hey y'all, y'all know what time it is? Woo! Get into it! We are back! Yes, I have a hairline. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm well overdue for a retwist and a lineup, so don't talk about me. But, I got the hang time. Loving my locks, loving my dreadlocks. It's a beautiful thing. Shout out to all of my friends who wear their natural hair. Please don't let yourselves be constrained by crummy Eastern European beauty standards because those need not apply. You can accessorize and stylize however you wish because life is made for those who are different and unique, not those who are mundane and complacent with life and all of its stringent rules and standards. In the words of Marnie's grandmother from Halloween Town, being normal is vastly overrated. He is a little hot today. And I don't own the music that you are hearing in the background. Shout out to Mr. Ambiance yet again for providing his music. Check them out on YouTube, please. Mr. Ambiance, A-M-B-I-E-N-C. And if you can't spell Mr., it's M-I-S-T-E-R. I hope everybody had a really great Mother's Day yesterday. I know I did. I was busy at work, but I was able to do a beautiful tribute to my mom here for story time. And for those who didn't see yesterday, hold on, because I'm going to turn around. Turn around. No, I'm kidding. So this is going to be our next book for Instagram. Um, it's called Anne of Green Gables. It's one of my favorite literary characters growing up. One of, also one of my mom's favorite literary characters. And we also used to watch the TV show growing up. So, that'll be on Instagram for those who want to watch that. But like I said, you never have to watch these videos when they go live. You're more than welcome to watch them in your downtime. And of course, okay, so I know I've been saying that I'm going to upload these videos. I will, y'all. I've just been really, really busy. And I'm trying my best to get everything I need done. So trust to believe, I will get those new episodes up for House Movie Castle and the final episodes up for The Never Ending Story. And that should get us all caught up. So please, please, please be patient with me. All right. Without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. I don't care how old I get in life, T will always be king. And ironically, I, when I was a child, I, I was not a fan of hot tea, at least from what I can remember. It wasn't until it was e eons ago when I was, me, my mom, and my youngest brother were visiting my godmother and god sister. They used to live in Jonesboro. Um, if you're familiar with Georgia, you should know where that is. Um, and they had a lovely apartment. And I remember I was, my allergies was getting to me and I wasn't feeling too great. And um, my godmother had made me a cup of tea. And I remember saying, I don't like tea. She's like, don't worry, you'll like this. And she had put some honey in it. And I think a little bit of brown sugar. I think it was like a lemon zinger for those who are familiar with celestial um, seasonings, which I have a bunch of their teas on my shelf right now. It was great, and I've been hooked ever since. I really have to go back into my memory banks and think how long ago that was, but since then, haven't turned back. Chapter 12, in which Sophie becomes Howl's old mother. Sophie did not see much point in blackening Howl's name to the king, now that the witch had caught up with him, but Howl said it was more important than ever. I shall need everything I've got just to escape the witch, he said. I can have the king after me as well. 
So the following afternoon, Sophie put on her new clothes and sat feeling very fine, if rather stiff, waiting for Michael to get ready and for Hal to finish in the bathroom. While she waited, she told Calcifer about the strange country where Hal's family lived. It took her mind off the king. Calcifer was very interested. I knew he came from foreign parts, he said, but this sounds like another world. Clever the witch to send a curse in from there. Very clever all round. That's magic I admire. Using something that exists anyway and turning it round into a curse. I did wonder about it when you and Michael were reading it the other day. That fool Hal told her too much about himself. Sophie gazed at Calcifer's thin blue face. Did not surprise her to find Calcifer admire the curse and any more than it surprised her when he called Hal a fool. He was always insulting Hal. But she never could work out if Calcifer really hated Hal. Calcifer looked so evil anyway that it was hard to tell. Casper moved his orange eyes to look around into Sophie's. I'm scared too, he said. I shall suffer with Hal if the witch catches him. If you don't break the contract before she does, I won't be able to help you at all. Before Sophie could ask more, Hal came dashing out of the bathroom, looking his very finest, scenting the room with roses and yelling for Michael. Michael clattered downstairs in his new blue velvet. Sophie stood up, collected her trusty stick. It was time to go. You look wonderfully rich and stately, Michael said to her. She does me credit, said Hal, apart from that awful old stick. Some people, said Sophie, are thoroughly self-centered. This stick goes with me. I need it for moral support. Hal looked at the ceiling, but he did not argue. That's the look he gave. I used to get in trouble for that. Rolling my eyes. Don't do it. Do not. Don't do it, kids. Don't get in trouble, okay? Don't roll your eyes in front of your parents. It's rude. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> they took their stately way into the streets of Kingsbury. Sophie, of course, looked back to see what the castle was like here. She saw a big arched gateway surrounding a small black door. The rest of the castle seemed to be a blank stretch of plastered wall between two carved stone houses. Before you ask, said Hal, it's really just a disused stable. This way... They walked through the streets looking at least as fine as any of the passers-by. Not that many people were about. Kingsbury was a long way south and it was a bakingly hot day there. The pavements shimmered. Sophie discovered another disadvantage to being old. You felt queer in hot weather. The elaborate buildings wavered in front of her eyes. She was annoyed because she wanted to look at the place, but all she did was a dim impression of golden domes and tall houses. By the way, Hal said, Mrs. Pitstemon will call you Mrs. Pendragon. And dragons today by go under here. Whatever for, said Sophie. For disguise, said Hal. Pen dragon's a lovely name, much better than Jenkins. I get by quite well with a plain name, Sophie said as they jumped into a blessedly narrow, cool street. We can't all be mad hatters, said Hal. Mrs. Pitstemon's house was gracious and tall near the end of the narrow street. It had orange trees and tubs on either side of its handsome front door. This door was opened by an elderly footman in black velvet who led them into a wonderfully cool black and white checkered marble hall where Michael tried secretly to wipe sweat off his face. Hal, who has always seemed to be cool, treated the footman as an old friend and made jokes to him. The footman passed them on to a page boy in red velvet. Sophie, as the boy led them ceremoniously up polished stairs, began to see why this made good practice for meeting the king. She felt as if she were in a palace already. When the boy ushered them into a shaded drawing room, she was sure even a palace could not even be this elegant. Everything in the room was blue and gold and white and small and fine. Mrs. Pensemon was finest of all. She was tall and thin, and she sat bolt upright in a blue and gold embroidered chair, supporting herself rigidly with one hand, in a gold mesh mitten on a gold-topped cane. She wore old gold silk in a very stiff and old-fashioned style, finished off with an old gold headdress, not unlike a crown, which tied in a large old gold bow beneath her gaunt eagle face. She was the finest and most frightening lady Sophie had ever seen. Ah, my dear Hal, she said, holding on a gold mesh mitten. Hal bent and kissed the mitten as he was obviously supposed to. He did it very gracefully, but it was rather spoiled from back view by Hal flapping his other hand furiously at Michael behind his back. Michael, a little too slowly, realized he was supposed to stand by the door beside the page boy. He backed there in a hurry, only to pl too pleased to get as far away from Mrs. Pitstemon as he could. 
Mrs. Pittstubbin, allow me to present my old mother, Hal said, waving his hand at Sophie. Since Sophie felt just like Michael, Hal had to flap his hand at her, too. Charm, delighted, said Mrs. Pittstubbin, as she held her gold mitten out to Sophie. Sophie was not sure if Mrs. Pittstubbin meant her to kiss the mitten as well, but she could not bring herself to try. She laid her own hand on the mitten instead. The hand under it felt like an old, cold claw. After feeling it, Sophie was quite surprised that Mrs. Pittstubbin was alive. Forgive my not standing up, Mrs. Pendragon, Mrs. Pinstemon said. My health is not good. It forced me to retire from teaching three years ago. Pray sit down, both of you. Trying not to shake with nerves, Sophie sat grandly in the embroidered chair opposite Mrs. Pinstemon, supporting herself on a stick in what she hoped was the most elegant way. Hal spread himself gracefully in a chair next to it. He looked quite at home, and Sophie envied him. I am eighty-six, Mrs. Pinstemon announced. How old are you, my dear Mrs. Pendragon? Ninety, Sophie said, that being the first high number that came into her head. So old, Mrs. Pinstemon said with what may have been slight stately envy. How lucky you are to move so nimbly still. Uh, oh yes, she's wonderfully nimble, Hal agreed. There's sometimes there's no stopping her. Mrs. Pinstemon gave him a look which told Sophie she had been a teacher at least as fierce as Miss Angorian. I am talking to your mother, she said. I dare say she is as proud of you as I am. We are two old ladies who both had a hand in forming you. You are, one might say, our joint <laughs> creation. Don't you think I did any of me myself, then? Hal asked. Put in just a few touches of my own? A few, and those not altogether to my liking, Mrs. Finstemmer replied. But you will not wish to sit here and hear yourself being discussed. You will go down and sit on the terrace, taking your page boy with you, where Hunch will bring you both a cool drink. Go along. If Sophie had not been so nervous herself, she might have laughed at the expression of Hal's face. He had obviously not expected this to happen at all, but he got up with only a slight shrug, made a slight warning face at Sophie, and shooed Michael out of the room behind him. Mrs. Finstemmer turned her rigid body very slightly to watch them go. And she stood at the, nodded at the page boy who scuttled out of the room too. After that, Mrs. Pinstemmer turned herself back towards Sophie and Sophie felt more nervous than ever. I prefer him with black hair, Mrs. Pinstemmer announced. That boy is going to the bad. Oh, Michael, Sophie said bewildered. Not the servitor, said Mrs. St Pinstemmer. I did not think he is clever enough to cause me concern. I'm talking about Howell, Mrs. Pendragon. Oh, said Sophie, wondering why Mrs. Pinstemmer only said going. Howell had surely arrived at that bad long ago. Excuse me. I take his whole appearance, Mrs. Pinstemmer said sweepingly. Look at his clothes. He is always very careful about his appearance, Sophie agreed, and wondered why she was putting it so mildly. And always was. I'm grateful about my appearance, too. And I see no harm in that, said Mrs. Pinstemmer. But what call has he to be walking around in a charm suit? It is a dazzling attraction, charm, directed at ladies, very well done, I admit, and barely detectable even to my trained eye. Since it appears to have been darned into the seams and one which rendered him almost irresistible to ladies, this represents a downward trend into black arts, which most assuredly cause you some motherly concern, Mrs. Pendragon. Sophie thought uneasily about the grey and scarlet suit. She had darned the seams without noticing it had anything particular about it. But Mrs. Pinstemmer was an expert on magic, and Sophie was only an expert on clothes. Mrs. Pinstemmer put both gold mittens on top of her stick and canted her stiff body as that both her trained and piercing eye stayed into Sophie's. Sophie felt more and more nervous and uneasy. My life is nearly over, Mrs. Pinstemmer announced. I have felt death tiptoeing close for oh so time now. Oh, I'm sure that isn't so, Sophie said, trying to sound soothing. It was hard to sound like anything with Mrs. Pinstemmer staring at her like that. I assure you it is so. said Mrs. Pinstemmon. This is why I was anxious to see you, Miss, P Miss Pendrack. <laughs> Say that three times fast. How well, you see, was my last pupil and by far my best. I was about to retire when he came to me out of a foreign land. I thought my work was done when I trained Benjamin Sullivan, whom you probably know better as Wizard Sullivan. Rest his soul and procured him the post of royal magician. Oddly enough, he came from the same country as Howell. 
than Howell came, and I saw at glance that he had twice the imagination and twice the abilities, and though I admit he had some faults of character, I knew he was a force of good. Good, Mrs. Pendragon. But what is he now? What indeed, Sophie said. Something has happened to him, Mrs. Pinstubbin said, still staring piercingly at Sophie, and I'm determined to put that right before I die. What do you think has happened? Sophie asked uncomfortably. I must rely on you to tell me that, Mrs. S Pe said Mrs. Pinstemon. My feeling is that he has gone the same way as the Witch of the Waste. They tell me she was not wicked once, though I have this only on hearsay, since she is older than either of us and keeps herself young by her arts. Howell has gifts in the same order as hers. It seems as those of high ability cannot resist some extra dangerous stroke of cleverness, which results in a fatal flaw and begins a slow decline to evil. Do you, by any chance, have a clue what it might be? Hmm. Calfer's voice came into Sophie's mind, saying, The contract isn't doing either of us any good in the long run. She felt a little chilly in spite of the heat of the day blowing through the open do windows of the shaded, elegant room. Yes, she said, he's made some sort of contract with his fire demon. Mrs. Penstemon's hands shook a little on her stick. That will be it. You must break that contract, Mrs. Pendragon. I would if I knew how, Sophie said. Surely your maternal feelings and your own strong magic gift will tell you, Mrs. Penstemon said. I've been looking at you, Mrs. Pendragon, though you may not have noticed. Oh, I noticed, Mrs. Pinstemon. Sophie said. And I like your gift, said Mrs. Pinstemon. It brings life to others, such as that stick in your hand, which you've evidently talked to, to the extent that it has become what the layman would call a magic wand. I think you would not find it too hard to break that contract. Yes, but I need to know what the terms of it are, Sophie said. Did Hal tell you I was a witch? Because if he did, he did not. There's no need to be coy. You can rely on my experience to know these things, said Mrs. Pinstemon. Then to Sophie's relief, she shut her eyes. It was just like a strong light being turned off. I do not know, nor do I wish to know, about such contracts, she said. Her cane wobbled again, as if she might be shuddering. Her mouth quirked into a line, suggesting she was unexpectedly bitten on a peppercorn. But now I see, she said, what has happened to the witch. She made a contract with the fire demon, and over the years that demon was taking control of her. Demons do not understand good and evil, but they can be bribed into a contract, provided the human offers them something valuable, something only humans have. This prolongs the life of both human and demon, and the human gets the demon's magic power to add to his or her own. <sighs> Mrs. Penstemon opened her eyes again. That is all I can bear to say on the subject, she said, except to advise you to find out what that demon got. Now I must bid you farewell. I have to rest a while. And like magic, which it probably was, the door opened, and the page boy came in to usher Sophie out of the room. Sophie was extremely glad to go. She was all but squirming with embarrassment by then. She looked back at Mrs. Pinstemon's rigid, upright form as the door closed and wondered if Mrs. Pinstemon would have made her feel this bad if she had really and truly been Hal's old mother. Sophie rather thought she would. I take my hat off to Hal for standing her as a teacher for more than a day, she murmured to himself. Madam, asked the page boy, thinking Sophie was talking to him. I said go slowly down the stairs or I can't keep up, Sophie told him. Her knees were wobbly. You young boys dash about so, she said. Page boy took her slowly and considerately down the shiny stairs. Halfway down, Sophie recovered enough from Mrs. Pinstemon's personality to think of the, some of the things Mrs. Pinstemon had actually said. She has said Sophie was a witch. Oddly enough, Sophie accepted this without any trouble at all. That explained the popularity of certain hats, she thought. It explained Jane Ferrier's Count What's It. It possibly explained this jealousy of the Witch of the Waste. It was as if Sophie had always known this. But she had thought it was not proper to have a magic gift because she was the eldest of three. Lydia had been far more sensible about such things. Then she thought of the gray and scarlet suit and nearly fell downstairs with dismay. She was the one who had put the charm on it. She could hear herself now murmuring to it. Built to pull in the girls, she had told it. And of course, it did. It had charmed Lydia that day in the orchard. Yesterday, someone disguised it must have had its secret effect on Mrs. Angoria, too. Oh dear, Sophie thought it, and I've gone and doubled the number of hearts he'll have broken. I must get that suit off him somehow. I'm speaking as younger Sophie in her head. Howell, in that same suit, was waiting in the cool black and white hall with Michael. Michael nudged Howell in a worried way as Sophie came slowly down the stairs behind the page boy. Howell looked saddened, 
You seem a bit ragged, he said. I think we better skip seeing the king. I'll go and blacken my own name when I make your excuses. I can say my wicked ways have made you ill. That can be true for the look of you. Sophie certainly did not wish to see the king, but she thought of what Calcifer had said. If the king commanded how to go into the waste and the witch caught him, Sophie's own chance of being young again would have gone too. She shook her head. After Mrs. Penstemon, she said, the king of Angry will seem just like an ordinary person. And that is where we will end for today. I'll see you later, y'all. Be good to each other.